about this. <laughs> I have no idea why I thought that would be an appropriate slide this morning, but when I saw it, I thought it was going to be a good idea. I am excited to be here, and I'm glad you're here. I hope you're excited to be here, too. Uh, there's a lot more of you than I thought there was going to be, to be honest with you. There's a lot of sickness going around out there in the world. Uh, if you've been here during the first couple of months of 2020, you know that we've been focused on something called the ripple effect. We've talked about the ripple effect of our thoughts and of our actions and even of our decisions. And in addition to being aware of the ripple effect of our lives, we've also been talking about the quantity of one. If you've missed some of those messages, uh, you can get caught up on our YouTube channel. You can go and watch them. And I want to do something real quickly this morning that I haven't done yet in the past, and we've been, we've had this YouTube channel up and running for over a year now. I want to welcome anybody who's watching this on the YouTube channel and invite them to come and worship with us anytime they'd like. So if you are watching this, I'm looking at the camera for a minute, uh, we would love to have you come and join us some Sunday morning. Now let's get back to the topic at hand. I know that we have a tendency, or at least I do, to look at the quantity of one as being rather insignificant. Think about it, one penny. How much value is in one penny? And the answer to that depends on your point of view. To us, a penny doesn't mean much, but I once listened to a missionary who challenged children to pick up every penny they found on the ground for a year and save them for him until he came back. I don't remember how much money they collected. To us, it was probably a very insignificant amount of money. But he came back, and I remember how excited he was telling the children how many children would be fed in his country from the pennies that they picked up off the ground. Remembering that made me think of this. One second in time passes so quickly that we miss it. It can be gone before we even realize it. How can one second in time be impactful at all, you might ask? What ripple effect can come out of the passing of one second? The most obvious theological answer to that question is that is how long it will take for us to realize Jesus is back. The Bible tells us that it will be in the blink of an eye. But what about here and now? Consider this, it would take about a second to bend over and pick up that penny off the ground that I talked about a minute ago. And that would start that ripple effect that reaches someone on the other side of the world. Because of how we chose to use that one second. And that brings us to the quantity of one that we might find ourselves thinking about most often. One person. One individual in a world of a little more than seven billion five hundred million people. Does that make you feel insignificant at all? But I just want to point out just from this picture that even in a world of more than seven and a half million people, that individual right there has done something right because you can clearly see that he is outstanding in his field. There you go. You're welcome. But when dealing with a quantity of one person, we might think or say, what can one person do? I can tell you that each one of those individual children who, collect, who collected pennies for that missionary made a huge difference in their world. I'm only one person. I can't do everything. 
I'd imagine that many of you have thought that thought either at home or maybe at your job. <clears throat> and it's true. <clears throat> you are one person. And you can't do everything. But I learned from a woman who is well into her 90s in age that this too is a matter of perspective. To this day, my friend, her name is Rena, she tells people, I'm only one person, I can't do everything, but I can do something. What a great outlook on life after living for 90 years. I'm honed in on the quantity of one this morning because that's going to be the focus for the month of March. There will still be an obvious ripple effect of everything that we talk about. And each week we'll be looking at an account of one person and what we know of their one encounter with Jesus. There are so many well-known biblical people that we talk about often and that we know a lot about. We know a great many details of the lives of people like David and Moses and Noah and many others in the Old Testament. Names like Peter and Paul and even a young couple named Mary and Joseph. And while we don't know specifics about Mary and Joseph, we know the most important facts of their lives. And then there's Jesus. We have the details outlined in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John to tell us all about Jesus, to tell us about his life on earth and his ministry to the people. But what I've never given much thought about or thought to are some of the other people that we read about. And most of you know, and Emily were talk and I were talking about it earlier today, most of you know that I mention a lot the fact that Annette and I love to listen to music. And one of the artists that I've really enjoyed listening to lately is a guy by the name of Michael Tyler. Anybody heard of him? He, he, he's kind of new, uh, kind of a young man. You may have heard some of his songs. He sings songs called Different and Never Been a Moment and a song called Even Then. But my favorite is a song that doesn't get played on the radio but it is also a song that's brought me to investigate these next few messages that I'll be preaching. It's a song called The Story I Tell. It's a song about these individuals that we read about in the New Testament. Individuals who are so different, yet who have a couple of things in common. One of the things they have in common is that their claim to fame is that they had a face-to-face -face encounter with Jesus. The other thing that they have in common is the thing that's tied into the song that I just mentioned. The chorus of that song goes like this. Nobody knew the troubles I'd seen. Nobody knew my shame. Nobody knew the places I'd been. I didn't know how to change. He saw a hope that I didn't see. He saw a better way. And the unbelievable thing about the story I tell is you don't even know my name. Think about how many people in the New Testament met Jesus and were told their stories. They were important enough to be recorded in the Gospels, but their names are never mentioned. Maybe their names didn't matter. Maybe it was the interaction that we were supposed to remember. As we move through the month of March, we're going to take a closer look at some of these people and their time with Jesus. And we're going to look at the impact it had not only on their lives, but on the lives of people around them. You know, that ripple effect that I keep talking about. Today I'm going to be talking about the woman who is known throughout the world of Christianity as simply the woman at the well. Unlike some of the others that we'll read later, this account is found only in John's Gospel. It's in the fourth chapter, and now's the time to turn there in your Bible. If you haven't already, or you can follow along on the screen if you like, 
Uh, I'll be reading from the New International Version, so a few of the words might be different than what you're reading. It's a story, an account of an interaction that's contained in the first 42 verses of chapter 4, and I'm going to read some of those, and I'm going to paraphrase some of the others. Let's start with reading verses 1 through 6 as we set the stage for this one woman's one encounter with Jesus. Now Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John, although in fact it was not Jesus who was baptized, who baptized but his disciples. So he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. Why was Jesus there? According to what we just read, he was there for a couple of reasons. He wanted to get beyond the influence and the interference of the Pharisees, and he was tired. He was tired from the journey. He didn't make this trip intentionally. Did you hear that word? Looking for the woman that would soon show up. Or did he? What we do know is that he made the best of the situation. He took advantage of the opportunity. That's something that we can learn from this story. It won't always be when we are looking for people to witness to that God allows us to cross paths with the people that are looking for some good news. Getting back to our story, we see that Jesus and the woman ended up being alone at the well. His disciples had gone to town to get food. Coincidence? I don't think so. I'm convinced that the woman would have been more or would have been less likely to have this revealing discussion in the presence of a number of men that she didn't know. After all, she didn't have the greatest history when it came to men. But that's getting a little ahead of ourselves. The first thing that happens is that Jesus engages her in conversation. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Some translations of the Bible have an even, what I think is an even better translation. It says, For Jews do not use the same dishes or for Jews do not drink from the same cup as Samaritans. That makes it even more personal in this situation. Jesus not only talks to her, but he's willing to drink from her cup or her ladle. And if that weren't confusing enough for this woman, Jesus then tells her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. It's obvious as we continue to read that she doesn't understand. She points out that Jesus doesn't even have anything to use to get water out of the well. So it's obvious she doesn't know that Jesus is talking spiritually rather than physically. She basically asks him, who do you think you are? Again, Jesus gives an answer that seems really unusual. Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. I love her response. I really do. I love it because it's so much like how we respond sometimes. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. 
Imagine the time and effort that could be saved and used for something more productive if you never got thirsty and never had to stop to take something to drink. Hmm. The same goes with hunger and eating, but we're at the water, we're at the well right now talking about water. Instead of commenting on what she says, Jesus changes direction on her. He's about to reveal to this woman just who he is and just what he knows about her. He tells her to go and get her husband. She tells him she doesn't have one. And that's all she tells him. I don't have a husband. Imagine her surprise. Imagine how you would feel if this happened to you. I can imagine she had a look of embarrassment on her face when Jesus said, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you've had five husbands and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have said is quite true. Things just got really personal, didn't they? The woman would have wondered why Jesus wouldn't have wondered why Jesus mentioned her husband because it wasn't good etiquette for her to be here talking to this Jewish man that she didn't know without her husband by her side. It amazes me that she didn't question how Jesus could know that she didn't currently have a husband, or how many husbands she'd had. She simply acknowledges that this man knows more than the average guy knows. She calls him a prophet, and then she does something that is so human, she changes the subject. She obviously doesn't want to stay focused on that part of her life. She turns to the topic of religion and talks about the fact that the Samaritans worship in one place and the Jews worship in another place. Jesus tells her that a time is coming when it won't be about where people worship, but it will be about whom they worship and why they worship. He says that they will be worshiping the Father in spirit and in truth. You think she's becoming more and more confused as time goes by? As she carries on this conversation with what she must assume is this strange man. Then she says something surprising. It's surprising to me when I read it. It wasn't surprising to Jesus when he heard it, though. The woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming, When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Not really understanding what Jesus is talking about, she admits that she believes there will be a Messiah and that this Christ will explain everything about God. It's a window into her life through which Jesus can see that she has a hope and a longing for the revelation that the Messiah will bring. So Jesus tells her, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. Do you realize that this is the one time that Jesus came straight out and said to somebody, it's me. That's huge. It's the one occasion when he voluntarily declares that fact. As a rule, he wanted people to figure that out by, for themselves by the evidence. But for his own reasons, he wanted this woman to know beyond a shadow of a doubt who she was talking to. As we read on in chapter 9, we see that the disciples returned from town. They went and got the food. They're surprised to find Jesus talking with this woman, but notice they don't question him. They're about to encourage him to have something to eat, which will then be the segue for Jesus to talk to them about food 
in much the same way he talked with the woman about water. Dwelling more on spiritual fulfillment than on human need. But right in the middle of that conversation with the disciples, in verse 28, we're told, Then, leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, Come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? If the only thing this woman ever did in her life was marry five different men and then live with another one, something's wrong. We know that's not everything she ever did in her life, but those are the things she remembered as she stood before Jesus. Because those are the things that Jesus talked about. She's still not convinced And she's still shocked that Jesus knew about her. But she's still asking the question, could this be the Messiah? I want to stop and make a point. And it's one of those points that will either cause you to think of somebody you know or cause you to take a moment and be convicted as you look in the mirror. I'm going to suggest that we sometimes spend so much time and energy trying to either hide the troubles in our life from Jesus or direct his attention to what we think are the good things in our lives. Church, Jesus already knows. We have to come to that understanding. He already knows. He knows the things you've struggled with in your life. He knows the troubles you've seen. He knows your shame. He knows the places you've been. He knows the battles you've fought. He knows how hard it is to change. But when we can find a way to leave our baggage behind and focus not on what Jesus knows about us, but on what he wants us to know about him, it's then that the change starts. It's then that we can make an impact. As we get to the end of John's account of this one woman's one encounter with Jesus, we're going to see the widespreading ripple effect of that encounter. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. These people may have been thinking what I told you that somebody once said of me. They may have been thinking if they've changed her, if Jesus has changed her, maybe he is the Messiah. Maybe that one encounter proves that he's the one. If that were all that happened, If the ripple effect only went that far, we would consider that a success for the gospel. It didn't stop there, though. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, We no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the Savior of the world. I can only imagine how far this influence spread. The ripple effect of the one encounter that one woman had with Jesus. And you know what? The unbelievable thing is we don't even know her name. But I can't help but wonder if that is not intentional On God's part. I can't help but wonder if the point is that her name doesn't matter. I can't help but wonder if I know someone who fits her description. I can't help but wonder if I fit her description. Her description is that she has sin in her life. And that while she doesn't know exactly what it is. She knows there's something missing. 
Remember, she said, I know the Messiah is coming. But she had never had an opportunity to discover what that meant to her. But Jesus offers a hope up until now that she did not see. He sees a better way. I think it's important for us to all recognize that. That no matter what bad Jesus knows about you, he also knows there's a hope and he knows there's a better way and he invites you in to that better way. He could have stopped the conversation with the woman at the well as soon as he accused her of what she had done wrong in her life. That could have been the end of it. He could have condemned her right there on the spot. But he didn't. And even with all the baggage that you have and all the baggage that I have, he doesn't condemn us either. He wants to invite us into that hope and into that better way. And that's the invitation today. He invites you to have a face-to-face -face encounter with him. He already knows you're good. He already knows you're bad. He already knows all of your ugly in your life. That's not the point of the encounter. The point of the encounter is he wants you to find out about him and his love for you. If you can relate to these words, nobody knows the trouble I've seen, nobody knows my shame, nobody knows the places I've been, I don't know how to change. Those last four lines, are for you. He sees a hope that I do not see. He sees a better way. And the unbelievable thing about the story I tell is that you don't even know my name. If you can relate to that, relate to this. Jesus knows your name. And that's all that matters. Let's pray. God, we love you so much. Thank you for your word and for the things that we find in it. The impact that one person's one encounter with your son Jesus can have not only on that person but on the world around them I pray if there's anyone here that's never had that encounter that they would go intentionally seeking it today intending to meet up with Jesus face to face not to find out what he knows about them he knows everything but to find out what he wants them to know about him and about you, about what you've done for us and what you will continue to do for us, leading us to eternal life with you in heaven through the sacrifice that was made by your son Jesus. We thank you for all of those things. We pray that you would use us in this world today to start a ripple effect for the gospel to lead people not to this building or to us, but to your son Jesus. And it's in his name I pray. Amen.